Okay. Let's begin. Uh, questions on the homework that we have okay. now. 9.3 and 9.4? Or did we answer 9.0? No. no. So 9.3 and 9.4. watching the R, right? Now the amplitude here is what? Nine. So if I take the square root, the amplitude is going to be three. So I know I'm going between minus three and three. Again, I've signed two theta, so that tells me the frequency. So I now have two sine functions so that I can split this into four. like between for a sine graph what is it going to look like I'm going to start at the middle right go to the top go to the middle go to the bottom go to the middle go to the top go to the bottom go to the middle here's the catch though because I'm actually have r squared whenever this guy gives me a negative number the graph can't actually exist there right mm -hmm. so what happens is I'm going to start drawing this graph whenever I hit negative Ignore this whole thing. Not possible. Right? Then I'm going to come up here. Whenever I hit negative, ignore this whole thing. That's basically how you're going to look at it. Right? My R does not exist here. It's a complex number. I can't draw it in the picture. So wherever the negative parts of my graph are, just ignore them because where this is negative, R squared does not exist as a real number. So from that, we can draw our graph. Or a circle of radius three. this. So at zero, I start at zero. When I hit pi over four, I'm on the circle of radius three, so I'm going to go around. Hit there. Then I'm going to come back to zero by the time I hit pi over two. There. So totally skip it here. I now start from pi, right? I'm at zero and five pi over four. I'm going to go to three. Then I'm going to come back to zero. And again, ignore the rest. So that's the graph. So I only have two pedals here. That was the trick. If it's a square, you have to ignore the negative parts because they won't be a part of your, your graph. Yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah. Another one? Just question that, like the the kind of points that we have given to where the tangent graph is horizontal or vertical, like this question. Yeah. I see the vertical line, uh, the 
horizontal line has the same point. So how, how can we determine this horizontal line or vertical line? Oh, you mean the zeros are the same in the top and bottom? Like, uh, horizontal line is on a zero part. The vertical is also a zero part. So how can we determine it? Oh, you use local tools to approach the limit. So tell me the question. What number was it? 53. What was it? R equals 1 plus cosine theta. 1 plus cosine theta. And the horizontal line. OK, so where's horizontal and where's vertical? So I'm going to need to find what's dy dx, right? Which is going to be dy d theta over dx d theta, right? I know what my x's are. This means my x is r cosine theta. My y is r sine theta. My r is this, so my x is 1 plus cosine theta times cosine theta. Or in other words, it's cosine theta plus cosine squared theta. My y is 1 plus cosine theta times sine theta. In other words, that's sine theta plus sine theta cosine theta. So if I take dy d theta, I'm differentiating this derivative of sine is cosine plus the derivative of sine times cosine is cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Right. Oh. Now if I take the derivative of, of x minus sine theta minus 2 sine theta cosine theta. Right. So now let's look at um, horizontal. For horizontal, I need that my cosine theta plus cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta equals zero. Right? How do I solve that? It's an identity. This guy's cosine two theta, which I can because of this is a cosine. I want to write that as a cosine, right? Or you can just use Pythagorean identity on this. Right? It says one minus cosine squared. Ultimately, you're going to end up with 2 cosine squared plus cosine theta minus 1, right? This guy is 2 cosine squared minus 1. Right now, this is a quadratic. Does it factor? Hopefully, it does. Um, so if I put a plus here and a minus here, that factors, right? And so I can have my cosine theta equals a half, or my cosine theta equals minus one. So there are two sets of angles here. Uh, did they give us a restriction on the angles between zero and two pi or anything? No. Okay. So where is cosine equal to a half? Pi over 3 is 1, and it would repeat every 2k pi, or 5 pi over 3, repeated every 2k pi. For this one, where is cosine equal to negative 1? Uh, where else? No, not at 0. k pi, where k is odd. So it would be 0 uh, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 3 pi, plus or minus 5 pi, etc. All odd multiples of pi, my cosine will be negative 1. So these are all the angles that will give me a horizontal tangent. Um, let's look at where the denominator, denominator is zero at the, it, it's 0 at the same time. We might have some trouble. Let's look at vertical. For the vertical, I need minus sine theta, minus 2 sine theta, cosine theta equals 0. I can factor out a minus sign. I do that with 1 plus 2 cosine theta. 
So this means my theta is n pi, where n is any integer. And here, I would have my cosine theta equals minus 1 half, which means my theta is equal to, how do I get minus 1 half? Come again? 2 pi over 3 will give me minus 1 half. Of course, this will repeat every k pi. Also, 4 pi over 3 plus 2 k pi. So now I see where you're having issues. It's with here, right? When your n is an odd integer, they're both 0 at the same time. So what will happen at guys like this? So this one will happen at 0 plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, etc. Right? So he's worried about these points here. Right? This is overlapping with those guys. So basically what, when that happens, what you want to do is you want to find a limit. Right? So, so we know that, the, say, the limit as x approaches pi, for example, we can generalize it afterwards, of dy d theta over dx d theta approaches 0 over 0. Right? But what is it actually? Right? Well, this 0 over 0 is a L'Hopital's rule issue. So basically what I can do is, to figure out what's going on in somewhere like pi, differentiate each term again. Right? So I'm going to find the derivative of this. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. This guy here is just cosine two theta. So let me differentiate that. It's minus two sine two theta. Differentiate the bottom, I get minus cosine. This guy here is two sine two theta, is sine two theta. And so if I differentiate that, I would get plus or well, minus cosine two theta. Two cosine two. Two cosine two. Uh, two cosine two. Right. So what is this approach? Well clearly the top still again approaches zero. What about the denominator? Cosine of pi is minus 1, right? And if I plug this in here, that gives me what? It would be cosine of 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi is what? It's positive 1, right? In fact, that will happen in general. So now I can sort of see what the pattern is. If I let this approach k pi, and remember my k is odd, right? That's where I have the overlap. Right? If I plug in an odd multiple of pi into the cosine, I get a negative 1. Right? Minus a negative 1 gives me a plus 1. If I plug in an odd number here, I double it so it becomes even. Cosine of an even gives me plus 1. Right? Times the negative 2 makes this minus 2. So in general, this limit approaches 0 over minus 1. So this means it's actually horizontal. So the zero on top actually wins here. Right? So whenever you have an issue like that, you get like they're both zero at the same time, it's L'Hopital's rule. Right? Try to find the limit some other way with using L'Hopital's rule. And if at this point you got it's undefined, that will be vertical. If here you got it's eventually you get to an answer where it's zero, that means it was horizontal. It's also possible to get a non-zero answer, like it gives you some other slope. So that's how you deal with that. Other questions? And of course, you continue to do the rest of the thing. But that's how you deal with those weird points where both the top and bottom are zero. Use local tools. Can we get something like that? Um, no. But it's good to know. Other questions?
sine graphs between 0 and 2 pi. Alright, so it would look like go from the middle to the top to the middle to the bottom to the middle to the top to the middle to the bottom. Alright, so if I'm graphing that guy, my amplitude is 1, so it's a circle of radius 1. These sections are what? Pi over 4, right? Mm -hmm. Pi over 4, 2, two right down. This is pi over 4, uh, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 6 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4, 8 pi over 4. This is 1, that's minus 1. So let's do that. So the sign, so we have. 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 6 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4, 8 pi over 4, which is 2 pi over 4. So the sign would start at the origin. At pi over 4, I go out, hit this, come back to 0. Then for 3 pi over 4, I go in the opposite direction, and back. Then for 5 pi over 4, I go down towards it, come back. Then for 7 pi over 4, I'm negative, so I go out and back. Okay, so that's 1. Now let's do the r equals cosine 2 theta. Cosine is going to start at the top, then the middle, then the bottom, then the middle, then the top, then the middle, then the bottom, then the middle, then the top. So when theta is zero, it starts here. And then I'm going to, for pi over four, I'm going to come over here and hit zero. Then this is going to be pi over 2. So at pi over 2, I'm going negative, so I'm going in the opposite direction. Come back. Then this guy here, this pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, I go towards pi. And then I'm basically going to close this loop here. So let's look at what the intersections look like. There's this guy. There's this guy. Where else are we? There's this guy. I think there are four leaves, right? Keep it going on the left side. Uh, on the top. On the top. On the top. On the top. There's, there, oh, there's another one here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's going to be that. And then I'm going to have two down here as well. And there's one more here. Right, so I sort of count how many of these kinds of intersections we have. I'll just find the error for like one of them. 
and then multiply the answer. That's going to be my idea. So how many do we have in general? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight guys like this. Let's focus on one of them. Let's focus on this guy. And then I'm going to multiply that by eight and see what we get. Um, where is this intersection point? How about we find where it intersects? So where is sine 2 theta equals cosine 2 theta? This is basically where tangent 2 theta equals 1, which means my 2 theta would be power 4 would be the first answer. There will be a, some more, obviously, but I only care about the first one. So power 8 is going to be that first intersection point. right? Now notice that at power 8, right, let me sort of zoom in here. This is the region that I want to find. Power over 8 is the angle that cuts it in half, right? So if I integrate from 0 to pi over 8, I found half that leaf. If I double that, I find the whole leaf. If I multiply that by 8, I find all of them. So basically, I'm going to find from 0 to pi over 8 is going to give me this area, and multiply that by 16. Now the question is, how do I find that area? So the distance from the origin to the outer curve, it's always going to be this curve here that it's hitting. Right? This curve is which one? That's the sine graph. So I'm always going to be hitting the sine graph. So I'm going to use area A is equal to 1 half the integral of r squared d theta. I'm going to multiply that by 16. 0 to pi over 8. And the guy that I'm going to use is, so that's going to be 8. Use the sine graph. Because right, that's the guy I'm hitting. Right, my distance that I'm measuring outwards is always hitting that graph. It'll run along this one, but it's still hitting the sine curve the whole time. So the sine curve is my focus here, and I just have to integrate that. So that's going to be 4 times integral of 0 to pi over 8 minus cosine 4 theta. Yeah, luckily for you, that, that one's also a bit harder than I would put on like a test or a Stop there. I want to make sure I get through the next section. Okay. So you guys can pass your homework to the front. talk about now our conic sections and the rotation of axes.
about the conic sections first. Okay, so I told you guys about this handout that I typed up. It's on the website. Hopefully you have it. If you don't have it, you can download it later. Uh, but I'm sort of using this as a guide because I don't really want to regurgitate everything. Um, this is again one of those topics where it's a lot less painful for you to just memorize the forms than apply them. <laughs> um, there are going to be some, some things that you can have some intuitive grasp of, but in general, we're just going to be memorizing and applying these guys. So there are certain forms of equations. Basically what a conic section is, is a section of a cone. The general cone has two parts to it, right? So it's like this and it might extend, but then there can be a bottom part. Right? So basically the thing is you get a circle if you slice it horizontally. You end up with a circle. Right? Um, if you slice it like diagonally, right, the trace that you make would be an ellipse. Right? Here you get a circle at any given point. Slice it diagonally, you'll get an ellipse. There's also another way you can slice it. You can slice it vertically, in which case you would get a parabola traced out here and also at the bottom. This is called a hyperbola. There are many ways to describe a hyperbola in all these curves, but these are some of the basic ways. And of course, if you slice it like along here, this will end up giving you a parabola. So basically, you take this object of a cone, you slice it in different ways, and look at the outlines that your slices make. It will make a bunch of different kinds of curves, and these are some of the main ones that you can make. The circle, the ellipse, the parabola, the hyperbola, we're going to talk about all of these in detail. I'm sure the circle you've seen many, many times before, but we, you've probably never seen the rest in detail. We're going to do them in detail right now. So the idea is we're going to look at the defining features of these curves, how to graph them, and how to determine these features. Not all of this you will need in the future, but some of it you will need, and I'll tell you what you will need. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about things like with the parabola, we're going to talk about things like the directrix, and with hyperbola, and ellipse, and parabola. With, with everyone except the circle, we're going to talk about what, the focus of the curve. But that stuff you're not going to need to remember after this class. But in general, you will need to know what a circle, what an ellipse looks like, what a hyperbola looks like, and how to graph them in general. Even in Calc 3, it's going to come back. But you won't need the high-tuned specificity that we're going to do this now. So um, just cram it for the test, and, and we'll be fine. OK. So first thing is talking about the parabola. One characteristic of this guy is there's a point called the focus. There's a line. This line is called the directrix. Basically, if you trace out all the set of all points that are at any given time, they are in an equal distance from the focus and the directrix, we call that a problem. So if we're on this vertical line, halfway between the distance, there's going to be a point here. And the points are going to go up like this. The idea is at any given time, the distance from this will be equal to the distance to that line. Distance to here will be equal to the distance vertically down to that line. For any given point, distance to here is equal to the distance all the way down to that line. Right? The curve that accomplishes this task, we call a parabola. That's basically what a parabola is, right? And it will happen 
measure the distance here, it'll always be equal. So that's basically what you need to know. That's some sort of idea. That gives you an idea of what the focus is. All right, so the focus is your pivot point where you can trace this curve out. And you want to trace out a curve that's equal distance from that focus and this horizontal line at any given time. This is a certain kind of problem. So there are two kinds of parabolas. So let's sort of, let's deal with the upward and downward opening, which I gave you, that's the first box here. So for example, this one will have to form this. This is called the standard form. I'm sure you've seen it before. Right. Um, usually, you need to complete the square to get it in this form. So you have to remember how to complete the square. But there are certain things we know about this form, like you can actually compute all how these distances work together, and that's basically what I told you here. Right? So from this, whenever this is the form, your vertex is given by the coordinate h comma k, which is just where the center for the h and the k are. Um, you can talk about a focus, right? Which is this coordinate. That's just h comma k plus 1 over 4a. a is the coefficient of that guy. There, and then there's the directrix, that horizontal line I told you about. It's called a directrix, and its equation is y is equal to k minus 1 over 4. Give it time. There's also the parabola that opens sideways, and I gave you the points that correspond to those. Um, basically, you sort of switch the x and y coordinate, their roles change, and that will happen there. So that's basically all we need to know about our parabola at this point. Do I have an example? Yeah, so let's go to problem one, the example on, on the a few pages back. I gave, I gave the examples at the end. So let's look at example one, it deals with the problem. this completely expanded, but I didn't really see the point. And here, basically here, I want you to find what it actually for, the directrix. I could have actually defined the focus as well, um, but in this case, I actually defined the directrix. So that was the question. So first, you put in standard form. So standard form, I want it to look exactly like that. So what I'm going to do, the only guy that's out of place is this 3. Move that over. So I get y is equal to 1 over 10 x plus 2 squared minus 3. And at this point, I just sort of match this up to that general form. So from here, I can see what my values are. My a is what? One tenth. My h is what? It's not two, no. It's minus two, right? The negative sign is in the form, it's very important. You'd have to change the sign. I basically think of this as x minus a minus two. My k is minus three. Now once I know that, and I know the formula for a directrix. I just apply that formula. This implies the directrix is 
y equals k minus 1 over 4a. My k is minus 3. My a is 1 10. It's basically minus 3 minus 10 over 4. If I can reduce, this is 5 over 2. So this is minus 6 over 2, minus 5 over 2, minus 11 over 2. So y equals 11 over, minus 11 over 2 will be the directrix. If you were drawing this as a picture, my vertex would be at minus 2, comma, minus 3. It would be opening upwards doing whatever. And that horizontal line here, y equals minus 11 over 2, is going to be that horizontal line that's at equidistance from the focus and, that, and this curve. Basically, um, how do you find the focus here, just for completeness, by just using that formula? I wanted to find the focus. That's just h comma k plus one over four a. Our h is minus two. Our k is minus three plus five over two. That's minus two. Um, that's minus one over two. So my focus would be like this guy right here at minus a half. So this is the line that are equal distance from that point and the curve. That's basically, you see you just like sort of plug it in. The problem is I don't find that interesting. There it is. So yeah, this is really something you can forget after this class. You'll never look at a parabola this way like in practice, I don't. I've never done it this is beyond calc two, so I, I don't suppose you would. Um, let's talk about the other kind of curve. This is a curve that you will see in the future, so pay attention to this. Um, the ellipse, a very, very important curve. So that's on the next page. They have this form, so there are two kinds Minus a squared for b squared and y minus a squared for a squared equals one. Um, if if I assume I assume my a is greater than my b in this case, for in this whole sentence, right? The guy that's on the, the bigger guy is under that variable, it means it will be stretched in that variable more than the other one. So for example here, if my a is the bigger number, it means I'd stretch in my y direction farther than I'll stretch in my x direction. So it'll look elongated like in the y direction. Right? It's this to number, what? Is it supposed to be It's a plus, right? So it'll be stretched in the y direction, right? Um, if the bigger number was under this, it will be stretched in the x direction. So that's basically, the denominator sort of tell you how it's elongated. The nice thing though, with ellipse, it's kind of nice to remember the formula. The center here is h comma k. The numbers underneath, when you take their base, that actually tells you the distance you move from the center. Right? So a is going to be the distance you move in the y direction, both up and down. It's sort of like the amplitude. And then the B is going to move, be the distance you move in the X direction. So that is kind of nice. So that's a trick that I use to remember how to graph an ellipse, which in general you're going to need to know. Um, there are also things like the foci, which basically one way to figure out how to describe how a, a, an ellipse can be drawn. is if you have two points apart, you attach a loose string to it, and then you make the string taut, and then trace out the curve that you can make with that string, it'll be an ellipse. Try it at home, I guess. 
Yeah, so if you pin a string at two points and then just stretch it out and then draw a curve, keeping it stretched out the whole time, you'll create an ellipse. So the two points that you have to fix in order to accomplish this, those are called the foci. And for an ellipse, there are two of them. There's the first foci, there's the second foci. The end points, these are called the vertices. These are called the major vertices. These are called the minor, minor vertices. Right? This length here is called the major axis. This length here is called the minor axis. This is all written down. So if you're not getting what I'm saying, it's fine. You can put it here, it's all written down. So um, we have equations for these guys. So, so for this set, so again, there are two sets. Right, where one word stretch horizontally, one word stretch vertically. For the vertical case, we have the following. The center is sort of what you think. It's h comma k. Then we can have the vertices. So at this point, it's sort of intuitive how to remember the vertices, right? Like the major one. Remember, you start from the center and you go up and down by A, right? So the major vertices, my X value stays fixed, so I'll keep this H. But my K value, I'll add and subtract something to it. What will I add and subtract? Well, the A. Right? I'm going to go up and down by the A in the Y direction, because that's the bigger number. Right? Um, the both side is again along the y. So my h, my x coordinate stays fixed. This guy moves up and down by a value that we call c. Right, which I sort of gave you a picture of how c was formed. It's actually a right triangle in here. It's nice how that works out. But c is governed by the equation, it's a squared minus b squared. Right, because you can create a right triangle here and use Pythagoras' theorem. So that would be the C, and that would be the B. Use Pythagoras there on that. Okay. So problems two and three are ellipses. Let's actually see how those would work. So if these guys show up on a final, an ellipse and a, or a hyperbola is, is a very likely choice. So let's look at problem two. Identify the conic. A hits center. And I'll also sketch it. Because if I actually this in a test, I'm also going to actually just sketch it. And this is what you're given 9x squared plus 16y squared minus 18x plus 64y equals 71. All right, ideas. So you need to complete the square. One thing when I see this on an exam and I know it's a conic section, I automatically know it's an ellipse. Why? Because the squares are both positive. That's going to be something that identifies an ellipse. Because I have all positive signs in that equation on that side. So I know it's going to be, I'm going to try to make it look like that. Now, of course, my x's and y's are in complete squares, so I'm going to try to get complete squares. So how do I, how do, I do that? Group them together. So I have 9x squared minus 18x plus 16y squared plus 64y equals 71. Then what? Start with the x. 
What do I do? So if you add 9 minus 9. Factor. I need to factor first. Remember, completing the square only works if the coefficient is 1. So I have to factor first. I'm going to similarly, I'm going to factor here. This is 16 plus, that's 4, right? So in, on the inside, now I'm going to do the complete square, right? So I'm going to have x squared min minus 2x. Half of that is plus 1 minus 1. squared minus 1 squared, plus, here I'm going to have 16, I'm going to y squared plus 4y plus 2 squared minus 2 squared. What's that? Equals 71. complete square, these first three, that's what becomes your complete square. It's going to be x minus 1 all squared, left over with a minus 1 here. Again, these first three becomes your complete square, and then y plus 2 squared minus 4 is left over. Expand the brackets. So I'm going to have 9 times x minus 1 squared minus 9 plus 16 times y plus 2 squared minus 64 equals 71. I'm going to have 9 x minus 1 squared plus 16 y plus 2 squared equals you have 71 plus 9 plus 64. What is that? That's 144. Well, that's nice. Then, what do I notice about this form? Is that on this side, there is a 1. It's always a 1. Right? That's something that's very identifiable from the ellipse. So here I have a 144 on that side. I don't want a 144, I want a 1. So what I'm going to do, divide both sides by 144. Does 9 go into 144? Yes? What does it go? What does it matter? 16 times, right? Because 144 is 12 times 12, which is 3 times 4 times 3 times 4. My 9 is going to cancel the 2 3s, so I'm going to look at 4 times 4, which is 16. Plus, 16 to this goes 9, because I just, just did the whole word there. Equals 1. Right? which pretty much looks like an ellipse. If I want to make sure it's an ellipse, that 16 I would write as 4 squared. That 9 I would write as 3 squared. Right? So now I can identify that. That's an ellipse. In this case, the a under the x is the bigger one. It's fine. So it says identify the conic, so I'm going to say this is an ellipse. State its center. The center is, what's the center of this ellipse? 1, one comma minus 2. Okay, now how would I sketch that? So here's my xy plane. First, I go to the center, so I'm going to go one minus two. That's my center, right? Now, from that point, I'm going to go up and down by what? So, in the y direction, notice that. 3 is the base. That tells me how much I go in the y direction. 
So from here I'm at minus two, I'm going to go up three units, so where am I going to land? At the level of one. And then I go down three, I'm going to end up at the level of minus five. Now, from this point, I'm going to go across four and this way four. So what am I going to end up with? So here I'm at one. Move four units in that way, I'm going to end up where? Negative three. So that's where I'm going to end up. If I move four units in this direction, where am I going to end up? At five. Those are your endpoints. Now you connect these with the curve. And that's the sketch of your ellipse. The major vertices, oh, I already know what those are. It's five comma minus two. And minus three comma minus two. The minor vertices would of course be one comma one and one comma minus five. So basically when you have this form, the, the, the base under the y tells you how far you move up and down in the y direction. This will tell you how far you move left and right in the x direction. Right? Of course, the bigger this number, the more it's stretched in one direction than the other one. Um, the foci would end up being on the major axis, right? So there are going to be two points here that are going to be my foci. I never actually defined these, but we could find them. Um, and again, the foci is a distance c from the center. Now, my, remember, my c squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. Right? So it always has to be the bigger number minus the smaller number, so I can take the square root. So this is basically going to be 4 squared minus 3 squared, right? which is 16 minus 9. Right? which is what? That's just seven. So this means my C is radical seven. So from here, this distance is radical seven, and I'm gonna move that to the left and right. So if I wanted to find the coordinates for the foci, it would be one plus radical seven, comma, minus two, and one minus radical seven, comma, minus two. So if we needed to find the foci, we could have done that as well. But that's basically a complete problem with an ellipse. You do that, like in a final, you'd be asked to do all that. Find, identify this, sketch it, find the vertices and the foci and all that. They'll ask you for it. Or I'll ask you for it. Questions? Yeah? What is an LP? No, my A is always the bigger number. All right, so when I, if you read how I set it up, I always set it up so that A is the bigger number. All right, so in this case, my A is the 4, the B is that. This is the horizontally stretching one, and the one you're, you're thinking of, the formula you're looking at, is for the vertically stretching. No, no matter is A under the X, whether it's under this or that, I always think of the bigger one as the A. It would have to be stretched along that axis. That would have to be the major axis. Yeah, there's more stretched. Yeah, the, the foci will always end up with the longer span. Yeah, it'll always be on that level, right? And that's how much it will deviate from the center by the value C. Um, we have another ellipse, so let's look at that. This one says, what is the foci of the given equation? So identify the conic, state its foci, and sketch it. So let's say here, 
Of course, on the final, I'll give you the expanded form, and you're going to have to complete the square to get the nice form. I'm not going to give you the nice form, but it's too, it's too nice. So it's 7x minus 2 squared plus 3, y minus 2 squared equals 21. So identify it, tell me what the foci are, and sketch. Okay. So again, I have two squared terms, and they're both positive coefficients, so I'm, I would think this is an ellipse. So how do I get it in the right form? Divide by 21, because I need a 1 on that side. So I'm going to divide this by 21, divide that by 21. And so this would be x minus 2 squared over 3 plus y minus 2 squared over 7 equals 1. If I wanted to stay true to form, this is radical 3 squared. This is radical 7 squared. Okay. So this is an ellipse. What are the foci? Well, I need to find my c. I know c squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. My a squared is the bigger number, so that's 7 minus my b squared is 3. So c squared equals 4, which means I'm taking my c equals 2, which means foci is equal to h. Um, who's going to be the longer one here? Y along the y, right? So my y coordinates are going to be the ones h comma k plus or minus c. My y is going to be the ones that's stretching by the c value. h comma k is the center. My center is what? 2, two comma also 2 plus or minus 2. Right? So I have two foci here. 2 comma 4 and also 2 comma 0. So if I graph those, those are going to be my foci. Let's actually graph it. And you'll note this is the opposite, right? This one is actually stretched that way. Center. Okay, so how this how's this guy gonna look? How do I move in the x direction? I move this way by radical three, that way by radical three. Radical three is less than two, so I'm not gonna hit the x-axis yet. Then I'm going to move up and down by radical seven. Roughly how big is radical seven? Radical four is already two, right? So radical seven is longer. So I'm going to go down even past the x-axis, all the way down to, this is going to be at a level of 2 minus radical 7, whatever that number is. This guy is going to go all the way up to 2 plus radical 7. So it's supposed to be along here. Let's, let me, let's make that. Supposed to be symmetric. So that would be my guy. The foci will end up at two places, two comma zero, which is right on the x-axis. That would be one of my foci. And the other one would be two comma four. So wherever the four is, that would be the second foci. But that would be my ellipse. So in the future, pretty much everything I just discussed, except finding the foci, is going to be important. You're going to need to know how to graph ellipses in general. And again, it's not so bad. You just look at the numbers under the bottom. It tells you how you stretch in the x and y direction. And the, these numbers here will tell you the center of your ellipse. Any questions?
to the next form, the hyperbola. This in Calc 3. You realize if you graph this formula in three dimensions, you get a saddle. It's basically the formula for a Pringles potato chip. You'll see that way. Hyperbola is the next very important. Again, you're not really going to need to know what the foci are or really the asymptotes in general, but here we're going to do that. And it's, it's not that bad to actually find them. Um, so you can have an east-west opening, so here. Here the sign change actually matters, so let me write those out. So this thing I put a squared on the minus one minus k squared. No. This one has a minus sign in the middle. That's what differentiates it from an ellipse. Ellipse will have both positive signs, right? This guy is the guy that opens to the sides, right? If the x is positive, it will open along the x-axis. So this will open like that. Right? And of course, there's the opposite case. I put my A with a positive value. Right? And if the Y is the positive square, then it will open along the Y. Right? That's, that's an important fact you will need to remember beyond this class, so just know that. Right? Depending on who has this negative sign, determines what kind of picture you have. Right? The vertices are these points here, like the vertices of two parabolas, right? Those will be called your vertices. Your foci will happen beyond this. So this will be f1, f2, f1, f2. Right? But that's the basic shape of a hyperbola. You can actually draw it more, um, more accurately, which I'm going to show you now. It's again not that bad. It's actually pretty nice how it how it's done. So it turns out that these parabolas aren't random. They actually follow asymptotes, right? So there's like a straight line that cuts across here. And this parabola will approach it asymptotically. That one will approach that asymptotically. And then there's another line that cuts across there, where this one will approach it asymptotically, and that one will approach it asymptotically. Right? And you can actually write this well, it should be as It's not drawn to scale, obviously. It should be going towards that. <laughs> you, you get the idea. All right. So we actually know how to find the equations for these guys. Should I write down the equations? So let's just use, maybe I should use the example like I gave in the So in problem four, I'm going to give you a problem like this one. So let's write down the corresponding formulas to the one where the y is positive. So the center is h comma k. And I'm going to have, what else, my foci is, now this one, of course, your foci is a change in the y coordinate, so I'm going to stay at the h, but my k is going to change by plus or minus c. The difference is here, the c is the sum of the squares for the hyperbola. So c squared is actually a squared plus b squared. That's how you find the c. Um, you can also have the vertices. Right. Again, the center is this guy here, h comma k, and you're going to move from that. So again, it's the y coordinate that's being affected on this one. Right? Whenever the y is positive, the y coordinate is the guy that's getting affected all the time. So that's going to be k plus or minus 
A, right? The A is going to tell us how far we move up and down to hit the vertices. And again, the B tells you how far you stretch in the X coordinate. So we're going to talk about that a little more as well. Um, what else do I, do I want to tell you? Anything else? Center, both sides, vertices. Right, the asymptotes. The equation of these asymptotes we also know. is y equals plus or minus, it's going to be a rise over run sort of thing. So the rise is the a, the run is the b. So it's a over b of the x coordinate, x minus h plus k. So I gave you all these formulas here. But that's how you sort of remember the slope. Um, if you don't remember this formula, it's actually not the end of the world. I'm going to show you a way how you sketch this. You can even figure out this formula by just how you sketch it. Right? So it's, it's a really nice um, maneuver to sketch a hyperbola. Really nice method. Right, where you'll see me draw this box in here. Right? I'm going to show you where that box comes from. It's actually not that hard to create it. So let's do an example. Problem four. Feels like we're in algebra class, right? Again, <laughs> algebra, I thought I got rid of it. Yeah, no calculus is just manipulating formulas and sketching them. So this is an actual problem from a final. This is from the fall 2014 final, problem 10A. So if you want to know what kind of question you'll be expected to answer, this is a good example. Draw a sketch of the conic whose equation is blah. It will give you that equation. Identify what conic it is. On your sketch, label whichever of the following are present. Vertices, asymptotes, both sides, all that stuff. Right? So that's a, a standard problem that you'll be asked. This was actually asked on the final last fall. Yes? Um, like going back, these um, conic sections, like they come from different slicing, slicing cones different ways. So if you kind of think about a hyperbola like that, would those asymptotes represent like the shape of that cone? That yeah, you can sort of think about that. Yeah. So when we had that cone going here, and we slice along here yeah. to get these two parabolas, right? Like that, the V shape from the cone, that shadow is sort of like that. Yeah. Because these cones will, of course, travel along the side of it, right. so it'll be asymptotic. Yeah. yeah, you can sort of think of it as that. Um, so let's actually do this problem. So first, identify what this is. Sketch it, and tell me what the foci and all that stuff are. So I see this on an exam, I'll pretty much right away know it's an, a hyperbola. Why? Because my square term for my x is negative. Right? That doesn't happen with an ellipse, it doesn't happen with a circle. Only a hyperbola will have that. Right? So I have a y squared and an x squared, and my x one of the squares are negative, so I know it's going to be a hyperbola. So I need to get it into one of these two forms here. Right? Obviously it's going to take some completing the square. So I'm going to have 4y squared, group those, minus 24y minus x squared minus 2x equals, I'll throw that 31 on the other side. Here, I want to complete the square, factor out the coefficient. y squared minus 6y minus x squared plus 2x equals minus 31. y squared minus 6y plus 3 squared minus 3 squared x squared plus 2x plus 1 squared minus 1 squared so this is 4 times this guy is going to give me a complete square y minus 3 all squared here I'm going to have a 9 left over 9 times 4 is what? that's a 36 minus these guys are going to give me a complete square. That's an x plus 1 all squared. I'm going to have a negative 1 left over. Minus 1 times minus 1 gives me plus 1 equals minus 31. 
So then I'm going to have 4y minus 3 squared. I'm going to add 36 and that minus x plus 1 squared. At 36, I'm going to get a 5, subtract 1. I will end up with a 4 on that side. And then what do I do? I need a 1 on that side. So I'm going to divide both sides by 4. So now I will have y minus 3 squared minus x plus 1 squared over 4 equals 1, right? Which that over 4, I can treat it as 2 squared. And I'd also treat this as 1 squared, right? Just to have that right form that I can look at. So this means it's a hyperbola. <gasps> Find where the foci are. Those guys are going to be in there. So notice that the y is the one that's positive, so the foci is going to look like h comma k plus or minus c, where I know that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared, which in this case is equal to 1 squared plus 2 squared, so that's 5, so my c is radical 5. So my foci is my h coordinate, which is minus 1, comma my k coordinate, which is 3, plus or minus radical 5. So they're going to be my foci. Um, asymptotes. It's going to be y equals plus or minus. And I'll show you how to figure this out if you forgot the formula. Because, you know, no one likes memorizing it. Um, so it's rise over run. So it's going to be 1 over 2 times this same factor here, x plus 1, plus the k, which is going to be 3. So that, that is the equation of the two lines. That will be my asymptotes. My vertices. So it's going to be h, k, plus or minus the coefficient under here, which is the a, so that's going to be minus 1, comma, 3, plus or minus 1. Right, so my two vertices are minus 1, comma, 4, and minus 1, comma, 2. I have the answers in here, by the way, so you can even rework them and make sure you get the right answers. Um, yeah. Let's actually sketch it for you. It's a really cool way to sketch a hyperbola. At least I think it's cool. Right? Uh, so we're centered at... Let me just write down for the record what the center is. Minus 1, comma 3. Minus 1, comma 3. Okay. So here's how you're going to graph this hyperbola. You're going to create a box. And it's going to be based on these two numbers here. So just like in the ellipse, you're going to move up and down based on this base here. You're going to move left and right based on that guy there. Right? So from the center, I'm going to move up and down by one unit. Right? So I'm going to go up by one to hit a four. I'm going to go down by one to hit two. Right? So that's my thing here. Then I'm going to go left and right by 2. So I'm going to go left by 2. So that means my x squared is going to now be 1. I'm going to move to the right by 2. So this will now be minus 3. Okay. So now you see those guys actually define the line of that box that I draw. 
right? The, the distance I move up and down define the, the height, the base and the height, the top. And the distance I move left and right define the left and right sides of that box. Now you draw the diagonals, just connect the corners. It turn out that's actually the asymptotes. Extend those. All right, so you draw that box by moving up and down and left and right according to these numbers here, and you create a box. The diagonals of those box will extend forever. That's actually the asymptotes. So if you forget the formula for the equation of the asymptotes, do not despair, because it's easy to figure out this point and this point by how you drew the box. You just do the rise over run y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and you can figure out what that is. All right, so you'll just need this equation of a line that passes through this point that has this over that for the slope. So now what you're going to do is realize that the y is the positive direction, right? So it means that the vertices are going to have, it's going to open up and down in terms of the y. So my vertex is going to be at that peak and the depth and it's going to open that way from like this. It's going to open up. Questions? Then create the box by going left and right according to what's the base under the x. Go up and down according to what's the base under the y. You create a box. The diagonal of the box are the asymptotes. And look at who's positive. You will open towards that axis. So the y is positive. I'm opening towards the y axis. So it means that along this line is where my vertices are. Right? My foci will, of course, be along this out as well. So one of them will be minus 1, comma 2. Uh, no, not uh, three minus radical five. So that'll be here, but that'll be the equation, and that's how you would sketch it. And that's an actual final problem. One more thing to talk about, rotation of axis. By the way, I highly recommend that you use my handout for, for the, as far as notes are concerned, because the, the handout that they put on the math department website, the formulas are weird, and they're not general enough. Right? They, they don't tell you about how the, if the conic is shifted, what you have. So. You'll, you'll get confused if you look at those formulas. It's, it's much better to use the formulas I put here. They're far more intuitive in the way they're set up. How about rotation of axes? So, so far we've dealt with the nice conics. Conics can get pretty crazy. Like for example, um, you can have conics that they're sort of at an angle. Right? So the box can go this way. And then you have an ellipse like doing that. Right? Or you have an ellipse that's slanted. Right? So conics can they can do some crazy things. Those conics have weird equations though. There's like a general form for a conic. Are you going to give us these equations? It is here. No, no, no. Oh, oh like to give you this? No. Uh, no? Oh. Like everything, you have to memorize it. You can forget this after these calls. Um, don't forget hyperbolas, ellipses, or 
parabolas though. You can forget about the focus. You're never gonna like use the focus. Use the focus. So this, this the order matters because we actually use the coefficients in a certain order. So ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus dy plus f equals zero. My a, b, c, d, e, f are constants. Whenever you have a non-zero x, y term, right? Notice that in all the, the forms I gave you before, if you multiply it out, you would never have an x, y term. That's why those are the nice behaving ones. Whenever you have an x, y term in your conic equation, that's when things get slanted and stretched and skewed. And you can have even things that are called degenerate conics, meaning they ended up not being a conic section at all, like they ended up being a point or something. Right? But this is in general what a conic section equation is. So the idea is, if you want to figure out what kind of equation it is, right? so it might be something like a slanted ellipse, but you probably can't recognize it from the equation. The idea is, you try to figure out what angle it's rotated by, called theta. And we can rotate it, change the variable, figure out, oh, it's actually an ellipse, but it's just rotated at this angle. Right? So this whole rotation of axes is sort of that scenario. It's when things are like rotated and you need to figure out what angle is it rotated by and how, how would I rotate it to undo it to figure out what's going on. That's sort of the background here. Feels like it could be useful in general, but I'm a math major and I've never seen this again in any math class I've taken. So. Well, I actually never did much more geometry. Maybe there are some geometry classes that would use this, but I never used it. Um, so it turns out you can actually, so whenever this is a non zero term, you can actually figure out what angle it is. They derived how they figured it out. We don't care. That's the formula. So. If B is non-zero, then the conic may be degenerate. That's just a fancy way of saying it's not a conic at all. Just an anomaly. Right? That's like the general would be a case like where like you have that cone and someone decides to slice right across that intersection. You just get a point. Right? It's, it's not really a con, right? So crazy things like that can happen. Um, you call that degenerate in that case. Um, so it may be degenerate or rotated at an angle. There. So it just might be an ellipse or a hyperbola or something like that, but it's just rotated in, in a weird, in a way that we can't really recognize what it is. And, but fortunately for us, we can actually figure out what that angle is, and that's the equation. angle that we can rotate to eliminate the xy term to get a normal looking conic. We can actually find what that guy is by this equation, cosine 2 theta is equal to a minus b over c, a minus c over b. Right, where the a, b, and c have to be in this order. The a is the coefficient of the x squared, the b is the coefficient of the xy, the c is the coefficient of the y squared. Example, problem five, an actual final problem. This was from spring 2011. 
So you're given the equation of a conic section in the general form, x squared plus 8 radical 3x plus 2 radical 3xy plus 3y squared minus 8y equals 0. So now they said, find the angle of rotation needed to eliminate the xy term. Notice that there's an xy term which means I can't complete the square to get anything of the form that we've been studying before. And so this is some sort of kind that I probably don't recognize. Um, so what angle do I have to rotate this curve by to get something that I can recognize as a certain conic section? Well, basically, I'm going to match sort of this match up to this formula in my head. So here I'm going to realize that my a is actually 1, right? That's the coefficient of the x squared. My b is the coefficient of the xy term, so that's 2 radical 3. My c is going to be the coefficient of the y squared term, so that's 3. This means we need cotangent of 2 theta to be a minus c over b. Our a was 1, c is 3, b is 2 radical 3. Saw that for theta. So you have cotangent to theta equals, this, minus, this is minus 1 over radical 3 which means I can flip both sides, tangent 2 theta is equal to minus radical 3, which means that 2 theta is equal to what? Tangent of what angle gives me minus radical 3? Power over 3, right? Because the sine of power of 3 is radical 3 over 2, cosine of power of 3 is a half. Divide those, you get radical 3. So my theta is just minus pi over 6. Which means if I rotate this function by minus pi over 6, I can actually figure out what it is. Do a change of variable. Um, but we don't actually care about what that change of variable is. Yeah, there are some equations that can tell you if you're given the general form based on what the ABCs are, you can actually tell, oh, this is actually an ellipse, but it's rotating. Again, don't really care. Um, one thing that we would care about, though, is my final was approved. Can you give us the, like, the general gist? So, right now, even though no one cared to ask, I'll give you the general gist. Come over yet. Uh, apparently no one cared, like no one no, passed yeah. this class, obviously. And why do I even want to know? It's pretty standard, it's not actually didn't go crazy to leave right now. Although I never do. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I heard? Some classes having their third test as a take home. Calc 2. What? Yeah. We should do that. No joke. Yeah. <laughs> Some few classes are. I think we're the only ones that aren't having a take home. <laughs> Did you say you're all spared? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the final. So yeah, there's a part one and a part two. Part one is a compulsory section. Um, it has 
six problems. Um, total 70 points. Part two, um, you have a choice. Three of four problems. Was it five? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's what I saw from previous finals. Well, Thirty points. This final, this is how it looks. So you're you're doing. I'm giving you ten problems, and you're pretty much going to do nine. Pretty much um, fifteen minutes per problem. Um, so in part two, there are four problems. You get to choose three of them. Is extra credit count three stuff? There's no extra credit on the final. <laughs> There's, there's no bonus on a final. Um, so standard. So basically, if I look at problem one, two, and three, it's pretty much what you'll see on a lot of finals. Um, bunch of derivatives. Right? All kind. I think there are, there are, there are four problems. All kinds of derivatives, including implicit differentiation. On problem two, a bunch of integrals, right? which you would have to use various techniques for. Uh, I also put four of those. So it's like, you know, like might have to use by parts or, or, or partial fractions or whatever, varying techniques. right? These are all varying problems. Um, three limits. And there are three of those problems. L'Hopital? Yeah, using L'Hopital's and things like that. What else do we need to know? Problem four. Like the format is standard. If you look at the pre, I think it looks a lot like the fall 2014 final. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so for four, the volumes of revolution or rotation. I'm going to I'm going to give you a region about two different lines. I'm going to tell you now. One line will be easier to do as the disk method. The other will be easier to do as the shell method. I'm not going to tell you which. You're going to have to figure it out. The numbers would be a lot smaller. They're not going to be as crazy as on the second test. Um, that was good. Five. Um, sketch a polar curve. Find area. So I'm going to tell you a certain area to find. Six is parametric equations. So that's pretty much the stuff like tangent lines, whether they're horizontal or vertical. Um, things like finding arc length will be important. Um, tangent lines in general, not only where it's horizontal or vertical. I'm going to ask you questions about tangent lines. So that's pretty much what part one looks like. Part two, there's going to be a work problem. So you'll have to remember work. You'll have to remember areas between curves. You'll have to remember. Can you use the shape? No. <laughs> Trapezoid. <laughs> what we did today, you'll have to know conic sections. I actually have a problem on conic sections. I didn't do a rotation of axes one. But I'm going to ask you to, to, I'm going to give you a messy equation. Not super messy. But basically, tell me what kind of conic it is, sketch it, identify the, the definitive features. Um, Do I care about what? 
Yes, I will care about some lipophosi and, and asymptotes if they occur. Um, right hand, left hand, midpoint rule. So approximating integrals, you're going to have to know that. Um, improper integrals, I have, I have to ask you about that. That's actually a very important thing. You won't see right hand, left hand, midpoint rule in the future that much, but you'll definitely see improper integrals all over the place. So you need to know how to do an improper integral. That's five, though. What? I'm not going by a problem. I'm just giving, throwing out the topics I'm seeing. Um, there's an, there's another arc length. Right, so this is the arc length with parametric equations. This is just arc length with y equals f of x or something similar. Uh, exponential growth and decay. Exponential <laughs> growth decay. And everything else we did in the class. <laughs> Why would I get super specific and then I'll... Yeah. That's a lot though, but a, a lot of it is important. Like there is integrals you're going to need that. Proper integrals you're going to need that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for part two, what if we do all four problems? Would you count the best three? Like if you do all four, I'll count the best three. Yeah. Okay. Oh. That's nice. No extra credit. No, no extra credit. No <laughs> bonus. So we have a test on Thursday. Yeah, it'll include what we need. So the test is going to be done Thursday, right? Thursday. We got a party out right after. Right. <laughs> she finished everything. I wasn't sure we do. Huh? We don't have class next Tuesday. Next Tuesday is finals. Can we move to Saturday? <laughs> I'll come in. I, I promise you I'll come in. That's <laughs> not no, in fact, I think it's the same shit. We have to know how to compare.